So um, welcome and thanks for being here at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I should say in terms of my body clock, it's actually 4.30 in the morning. So don't expect too much um, jumping up and down. So there's always an advantage and a disadvantage when somebody comes in a bit late in a sequence like this. The, the advantage is that we reset some things to zero and so we can start again and things that you've missed or things that you've um, not understood, I hope might become clearer. The disadvantage is that um, you may get bored because I'm going to do some things again. So um, if, if I go on too long about something that you feel you all know about, um, let me know. Just say, I'm bored or something. I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you an, an opportunity to say that at various stages. Um, the other thing is you'll see that the slides I'm using were from a course I gave two years ago and this is partly because um, my university in its wisdom updated my computer a bit before I came here and killed a whole load of files that I had um, which means that I couldn't use the things that I'd prepared for here so I've, what I've done is I've done I'm using these slides from two years ago and I've created some other slides in PowerPoint because I can't do proper LaTeX Beamer at the moment. So anyway, it's a course on um, piecewise smooth maps. And should just go. you know about these. You've been hearing about them all week. So what have we got? We've got a map. We've got areas of face space on which we have perfectly nice, ordinary, smooth, maps defined and then we've got boundaries across which the map can change and the map can, change, can be continuous but with discontinuities in the derivative or it can be completely discontinuous. Um, what I'm going to try to do, I mean you know you've all got your own problems, you've all got things that you're trying to work on so I'm going to try to emphasize methodology and things that you can do with maps rather than give you lists of different behaviors and things like that. Um, the other thing is that bifurcation sequences can become very, very complicated in the smooth case. And um, Victor was showing you some pictures, certainly yesterday, of just how complicated some of these things can get. And so then it's then a question of how you organize those ideas. And here's a, an example of complexity, actually from David Simpson, which was really nice, simple, piecewise smooth system, in fact, piecewise linear system, but with infinitely many stable periodic orbits. So this is, you know, if you're trying to make lists of what can happen, this is a very nice example because it shows that what you can't do is say, oh, I've got three stable periodic orbits and that's the end of the story. But you actually have to work a bit to see how many stable periodic orbits you've got, if that's what you're interested in. And um, it should be said, that this is not surprising in many ways because in the smooth, as an equivalent smooth theory um, for homoclinic tangencies in maps, which predicts what are called new house um, phenomena, infinitely many sinks. And so there is, this isn't particular to the smooth, non-smooth um, world. It, it happens in the smooth case just as much. Um, robust chaos, so this is something that Sumitro was very much involved in um, sort of defining and looking at. This is, this is very different to the smooth case. So in the piecewise smooth case, you can get systems where chaos, chaos is persistent, so you change the parameters and you still have chaos. Okay, so you have chaos in a robust way, um, but the dynamics is not the same. Okay, so there's a, there's a subtlety here. It's not saying, oh, I have an attractor and I change the parameters and I have the same attractor. Although it may look the same, the details of it are changing. Okay, so there's, there's a rich dynamics going on there, but the chaotic attractor itself is persistent. The existence of a chaotic attractor is persistent. And if you think about the nice smooth examples that you might know, the unimodal map, it's absolutely not the case the unimodal map, that the chaotic attractors are persistent. They exist on positive measure of parameter values. 
So your chance of picking a parameter value is non -zero, with chaos is non-zero, but if you perturb from that a little bit, you'll find stable situations with stable periodic orbits. Okay. Again, for generic standard families of maps. Okay. And a bit about me. So I haven't been around, so I thought I should tell you who I am. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Manchester. I'm also scientific director at the International Centre for Mathematical Sciences in Edinburgh. And I've sort of worked for a long time on different areas, really, of bifurcation theory and trying to understand bifurcations, from homoclinic bifurcations in smooth systems. So in the mid-80s, I was doing that sort of stuff, which actually, as we'll see a bit later, brings you into the non-smooth world naturally. So you shouldn't think of the non-smooth world, or a piecewise smooth world, I should say better, um, and the smooth world as being utterly separate. They interact in all sorts of ways. Um, I've worked on quasi-periodically forced systems, strange non-chaotic attractors, piecewise smooth systems as well. And I quite like when I can to do a bit of application. So I've done applications in models of cardiac arrhythmias, ecological models, neuroscience, paleoclimate. I actually quite like, I haven't published this yet, but this is quite fun. It's about trying to understand how the climate might vary over billions of years and sort of simple um, models for that. And that sort of thing. And I also do a bit of popular maths too. So this is a little book, um, Maths in Minutes, where I've been involved with quite a, a number of popular maths projects. So that's me. So what are we trying to do? Well, what I hope that I can do more than anything is persuade you that there are not, that although the, not, the piecewise smooth world is incredibly complicated, there are techniques that you can use to um, analyze them. And, you know, if you come away just knowing that, ah, if I come across this problem, I can look this up, then I hope, you know, I feel that I will have done something. Given the time scale, given the number of what we, what we can do in a short time scale, it's going to be sketchy. Okay, so I'm not going to give you full detail about everything, but I do like giving some detail. Because actually, if you're going to use any ideas, you've got to know how you get into actually doing the maths. Okay, it's not enough just to say, oh, there's this and this and this and this and this. You have to say, in my example, if I had an example, what might I need to do? What might I try out? And that sort of thing. So that's not the plan for this course, that's the plan for that course. So you've probably seen, me, I mean, this is sort of setting the scene, I know Sumitra has done some too, but I, and it's always worth just thinking about what we're doing and why we're doing it. This is a real, well, it's a real photograph, okay? So you had a stroboscopic um, camera, and he's just taken a picture where I think this is time going along here, and the ball is just bouncing up and down. He's, he's introduced the time uh, variation. And what you can see is it's a ball doing a ping pong ball doing exactly what you'd expect a ping pong ball to do. Okay, so it's going down, down, down. The amplitude, you're losing energy at each bounce. The amplitude is going down. You can actually do the maths in about 15 minutes to work out what the maxima are doing if you assume. Um, you know, the amount of the velocity satisfies a simple restitution law. So you might be able to try to fit some sort of curve through the maxima here. And of course, the really interesting thing happens sort of off here, okay? Which is that you get an infinite, at least within the simple model, you get an infinite accumulation of these bounces. So you get a sort of infinity. So you're expecting it to go off and off and off and off and off and off. But of course, if you do the analysis, and this is just, you know, it's high school maths, effectively, um, with a bit of, you find that the time between successive um, bounces satisfies a geometric progression, which converges. So in fact, we wouldn't have to go past the line that we're not allowed to cross in order to see the accumulation. 
Okay? Because they happen faster and faster and faster and accumulate. And but I still think that's sort of interesting. Okay, it's not deep. And it doesn't take hard maths. But it's interesting about the different sorts of infinities you've got here. You've got infinitely many bounces, but you don't have it happening in infinitely long time. This is where I started learning about um, piecewise smooth models. So this is a model by um, Guckenheimer and Williams from the late 70s of the Lorentz um, equations. So how many people know what the Lorentz equations are? Aha. So a long time ago, People didn't know about chaos. Actually, they did. But they were either pure mathematicians or dead. Okay, Poincaré probably knew quite a lot about chaos, um, but he didn't go into the detail. Um, throughout the, the 1920s and 30s, pure mathematicians were working on symbolic systems, which were very much like chaotic or had a lot of the properties of chaotic systems, and they were interested in them in the same way that we're interested in quite a lot of these things. But the fact, the idea that you might actually see something like chaos in um, physics was not current. It just wasn't part of the way people were thinking about things. So there had been some hints that there was something like this. And of course, if you start thinking about statistical physics, you want to do that. And in 1962, um, a meteorologist called Ed Lorentz, working with a guy called Safman, wrote down, they, they were interested in the, in the weather. So that what they did was that they took the equation, the fluid equations for the weather in the layer and expanded the solutions as um, Fourier um, series, effectively, having periodic boundary conditions. Okay. And then they looked at the time variation of the spatial Fourier coefficients. And they got a set of equations. And this was an infinite, because it's an infinite Fourier series, it's an infinite set of equations. So then there's a question about what you're going to do with an infinite set of equations in 1962. Okay. And that's sort of where they stopped. And then Ed Lorentz continued and said, right, I'm just going to look at the first three modes, the ones that I think are most important, and I'm just going to ignore the rest. So if you do that, you get a three-dimensional ordinary differential equation, depending on parameters that are related to the physics, the, um, the aspect ratio of the box, the Rayleigh number, that sort of thing. And he stuck it into the computer. Remember, this is 1963. That means that you bring sort of cards to somebody, you hand them over, they stick them through a machine, that then gives the program, and then you get some numbers out. Okay, not pictures, numbers. Okay. And then you try to interpret the numbers. And he sort of thought he was getting some quite interesting results. He thought about oscillations, and he was particularly interested in the way the oscillations went round one way, so oscillations in one direction, oscillations, and then turned around into oscillations in the other. And he was preparing this for publication. He thought, well, I'd better check my program. So he checked his program. And it did something completely different to the sequence that he had before. So you have two choices. You can either say, oh, I made a mistake the first time around. Actually, you've got three. Or you can say, oh, I made a mistake the second time around. And go for one or the other, check the program carefully, put it through again, decide which one it was. But actually, Lorenz worked out or realized, and this was sort of the genius of what he did, was that there was something much more deep going on here. What he'd done was, instead of taking the initial conditions exactly as he'd put them in the first time around, he'd, I can't remember the details, whether it was six um, digits and he'd used three or six digits and he'd used five or whatever it was. And he realized that that was the source of the completely different behavior that he was getting. Okay. So, he, and this was really, it wasn't actually the first example. There was a very nice um, paper by Ricky Tucky on dynamos 
um, which predates Lorentz, and there are other things that you could argue with things. But this, this is probably the most influential first physics paper that suggested there was chaos. He called it non-periodic. So he was talking about non-periodic motion. And so he published that in a, in a meteorological journal. And the thing about meteorological journals is that mathematicians don't read them. So it sat there for a while. At the same time, Steve Smale, um, who's a pure mathematician, was working on getting the, the mathematics, and we'll see some of his ideas coming in to this talk later, the mathematical ideas of um, chaos and the idea of a horseshoe. So this horseshoe is, the, if you like, the fundamental model of low-dimensional chaos. And so you had pure mathematicians starting to get interested in chaos, physicists starting to get interested in chaos, and sort of nothing in between. And then a good friend of um, Sumitru's, Jim York, started to put these things together and wrote two, well, actually, he, Jim York wrote lots of really important papers. But in the 70s, the two that come to mind is the one that introduced the word chaos, which was period three implies chaos, paper with um, Lee. And this is a wonderful paper, partly because it's a fantastic title, and they take great care not to define what chaos is. Okay, so the idea is that you've got this, this sense of chaos, but actually, in the paper, Chaos is used as a sort of, uh, you know, it's complicated. But they talk about scrambled sets. They define very particular mathematical definitions for different sorts of things. And I think one of the things that Jim York was trying to do was not pin down the idea. It's, much, it's, it's really quite um, subtle. The second one with Kaplan, he wrote, was looking at mechanisms whereby you could get Ed Lorentz's sort of chaos coming out. So what was actually happening? And basically, the idea is that you have a fixed point here. So this is a flow, and it's a saddle. It's actually, in the, in the equations, it's three dimensions. But imagine that locally, here you have a strong contracting direction. And then you have a saddle type behavior. And there's a parameter value at which the two branches, there's a symmetry here. So if this branch comes back here, then it comes in on the, back on the stable manifold of the origin, and you have what's called a homoclinic orbit. And because of the symmetry, you would have a pair of homoclinic orbits. And then when you break away from that particular parameter value, so you, instead of coming back here, you come back a bit beyond there, that's when you start creating the interesting things. Now, originally, oh, in the Lorentz equations, those are not initially attractors. Something else happens, which I'm not going to describe, which makes it an attractor. But the basic idea is that when it becomes an attractor, you have this sort of behavior where, think about this line here. So you've got things then moving either left or right on a two-dimensional surface. And then imagine that the two-dimensional surfaces move around and then are glued together. So, of course, for the actual differential equation, this is just a model. You're now gluing them together on this line. So now you say, right, if I start here, I go around, ooh, and I hit here. And then I go around, because I'm on the left now of here, I go around this way. And what you see if you try to take a return map on this piece here is something like this, that the saddle separates things just to the left of that point. You spend a long, long, long time down here and are sent round to there. So that means on the left, you're sent far to the right. And on the right, you come down, but you're on the right, you stay on the right, and you go round, and you go far to the left. So the saddle of the smooth differential equation has created a discontinuity in the return map. And the slope here goes to infinity because of the ratio of the eigenvalues here, if you do the linear analysis um, 
It's not hard to do. If the slope was the other way around, you'd have a flat map where instead of being infinite slope, it's got zero slope, apart from a very particular case, which we don't need to talk about because it's rare. OK, so what I want you to take away from that is that just because you're looking at smooth differential equations doesn't mean that associated return maps have to be smooth. Okay, the things like saddles are enough to tear things apart. And that's really the situation in the 80s that um, got me interested in um, piecewise smooth maps. It, it, it's, um, yes, it's a short answer, except it can be any power less than one. Okay, so it's as though, in, so square root is a sort of, quotes, natural way, but here the singularity, the nature of the singularity is the rate given effectively by the ratio of these eigenvalues. So the ratio of these eigenvalues doesn't have to be two to one or anything like that. So it's, it's as though the square root appears as a particular case in actually a continuum of possibilities here. Right, so why else look at non-smooth? Well, one reason is that sometimes non-smooth is much easier than smooth. Okay. Um, Isakevich did some very nice models of neuron firing, and neuron firing is complicated. But roughly speaking, the story is you have a potential in the neuron that goes up, and if it gets high enough, it fires. And then there's a reset. But the details of that are completely complicated. But Isikevich, and actually he wasn't the first by any means. Um, I mean, Arnold has written about this in the 70s and so on. Um, you have something, you, you, what you need is a mechanism whereby a potential rises, something happens, and it gets reset, and then it can ha happen again, with various degrees of complications. But this, in its simplest case, is a non-smooth system. You have differential equation, fire, reset. Differential equation, fire, reset. So you've got this reset, which is the so source of the non-smoothness. Um, Leon and Glass had some nice models of the heart. Again, cardiac arrhythmias. Um, which were non-smooth, and again, that's 70s. I'm going to talk about the Henontolozzi in a minute, because this is, um, I think, one of the big things for me. One-dimensional unimodal maps, I've, I've said Pierre Collet, but um, because he did some stuff on um, the chaos associated with this, there's another route to non well, piecewise smooth through the unimodal maps, which is through um, needing theory, and I'll talk about that in a bit, and existence of invariant measures. If you like, in the 80s and 90s, there was this big push to sort of try to understand how to characterize chaotic sets. And an obvious way is the sort of, I mean, you know, when, when we talk about chaos, part of the thing that we're trying to say is, look, it's sort of not predictable. But what does not predictable mean? Well, it means that you've sort of got probability coming into it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that in an ideal situation, you'd have some sort of probability distribution function or something for where you were at various stages. And in ergodic theory and dynamical systems, that's called an invariant measure, roughly. And so proving the existence of chaotic sets with nice probability distributions associated with them became one of the key bits of trying to understand chaos for the purer side of the community. And it turns out that things like the unimodal map have this really sticky problem. Okay, so you're try when you're trying to prove um, that things distribute uniform, or not uniformly, but according to some distribution around things, what you want is some sort of expansion. You want sort of to forget a bit about where you started. You, wanted, you want things to be pulled apart and spread out. Now in the unimodal map, so you know this, this is the quadratic map or something like that, there's a critical point 
at which the derivative is zero. Now, if the derivative is zero, that's infinite contraction. So you have these places where the map is really strongly contracting. And that is technically a really tricky problem in terms of proving um, in the existence of invariant measures. And the way people get around it is by proving or looking at how long it takes on average to get back to the contracting area and showing that there's sufficient expansion away from that, that these coming back is relatively rare. And so you're going expanding, 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 ouch, contract, expand, 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 ouch, contract. But the contraction doesn't happen op often enough to prevent, on average, the expansion. But roughly speaking, that sort of idea was very, very hard because of this recurrence issue. And, uh, but a lot of the um, early sort of ideas of how you would prove the existence of an invariant measure were done on piecewise smooth systems because you could do that then with something like the tent map or equivalent of that which avoids the problem of a derivative going to zero. You still get the folding, but you avoid derivatives going to zero. Right, so Lozier and Henon. This, I think, is, is critical in terms of understanding, certainly for me, a, a lot of the reasons why you might go into piecewise smooth. So if you just look at this thing here, xn plus 1 equals 1 minus axn squared, that is effectively the unimodal map, rescaled. Okay? So you've got a quadratic map, you've got a parameter. Um, roughly speaking, that's the one-dimensional map. Now, Michel Henon was an um, astrophysicist at, the, at um, the Observatoire de Nice in France. And Nice, strangely, for various reasons, um, was one of the hotbeds in the mid-70s of the starting to try to understand features of the one-dimensional map. It was um, Pierre Coulet and um, Charles Tresser working there. And they gave a talk, which Henon, as a physicist, was listening to. And he said, look, xn plus 1 equals 1 minus a xn squared. Utterly uninteresting. Why? Because it's not reversible. Okay, you take your line, each point has, well, most points have two pre-images. Okay, so you can't go backwards. And we all know for anything physical, well, up to some point, anything physical, forwards, backwards, it doesn't really matter. Okay, you can run it, you can run a film backwards, you can run it forwards. Okay, so his thing was, and this was sitting in the back of a seminar, um, how can I take something like the unimodal map and make it quotes physically relevant? The sort of thing that could be the return map of a differential equation, the thing that has an inverse. And he very quickly realized that by adding, taking this, think of B as a small parameter here, I'm adding a bit of Y, and Yn plus 1 I'm just going to say is Xn. So I'm coupling, and I'm making a two-dimensional map where this is basically b x n minus 1. And when b is 0, it's just the unimodal map. But the determinant of the map is b or minus b, um, minus b probably. Um, and so it's non-zero if b is non-zero, which means it's invertible. So by just adding that little term, he made the map invertible. And you look at this, if you imagine that B was very, very small, then you would collapse onto a, a piece of a parabola here. Okay, because you'd have X doing its um, unimodal type stuff, and Y just being Xn minus 1. And so it would just be sitting on a parabola. Okay. Well, as B increases, you can see that the parabola actually has structure in it, and structure in the 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 For some values of the parameter. So Henon wrote a very nice, very influential article that said, is this 
a chaotic tractor. That's hard. Very hard question. It's a very easy question to ask. It's an incredibly hard question to answer. So, Lozzi, who was also in Nice at the university, said, look, Michel's done this stuff which is all tremendously clever but really hard. Suppose that we replace the x squared by a modulus. Then we've got a piecewise linear system. And for goodness sake, if we can't understand piecewise linear systems, where are we? So he wrote a very influential paper about two years later on this map, which is now called the Lozzi map, which is an example, actually, of the border collision normal form. Which, uh, uh, okay, it's, a, it's, got a, it's a border collision normal form with particular structure. And Lozzi wasn't able to prove that that had strange attractors either. Certainly when B equals zero, he could. But when B is non-zero, it was difficult. However, let's just... We now have, in the late 70s, two models. One involves x squared, one involves modular specs. In 1980, uh, Michel Mizerovich proved the existence of a nice um, chaotic attractor for the Lozzi map and actually open sets of parameter values for which there was a nice um, chaotic attractor. For the Henon map, at the values that Henon originally chose, we haven't got a clue. Still. So what do we know about the Henon map? Well, quite a lot. We know, for example, that there do exist nice chaotic attractors. But we don't know quite where. So there's some very nice results by uh, Marcelo Viano that prove the existence of nice chaotic attractors in smooth systems under certain circumstances, which the Henon map can be shown to satisfy, what, and show that there are lots of these, so positive measure of them, but, what, but it's a sort of implicit proof. So it says there are parameters such that this happens, not at these parameters, this happens, okay? So there are different sorts of proofs and different things. You see, Mezierovich was able to prove in 1980 particular sets of parameters at which this has nice chaotic attractors. For this, apart from some very, very special points, again, which I'll talk about a bit later, um, we, don't, we don't know. We have implicit results. And so, again, that's the sort of thing that you need to be thinking about when you're trying to use results is, what am I trying to say about this? What's useful to say? And how much detail do I want to go into? Okay. So let's, again, most of this lecture I want to do that's sort of setting the scene through smooth dynamics. Okay? Because smooth dynamics is our model of how you do stuff. And what I want to think about, or get you to think about is a bit, is how you make that transition from the smooth to the piecewise smooth world. Because I think there's, there's a, as we'll see as I do some of the smooth stuff in this lecture, there's a whole set of classical ideas that can be applied just as well to the non-smooth case. Okay. So what do we have? In smooth dynamics, we have the stable and center manifold theorems. These are wonderful things that basically tell you that in when life is simple and you look just at fixed points, there are only two for... There are only, well, in one dimension, there are two generic bifurcations. In two dimensions, there are three. Okay. And you can have some complications, but effectively, whatever the ambient dimension you're in, okay, whatever dimension phase space you're in, typically, when things go unstable, they go unstable by either a real eigenvalue going from negative to positive, or a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues going from inside the unit circle to outside. Sorry, I should try to get going. If I'm doing differential equations, going through the imaginary axis, okay, to get a, going from negative to positive real part, and that's the only way that it can happen. That's the typical way it happens. It's not the only way. It's a generic way it happens, 
And then you have a center manifold reduction that says, right, in the first case, it's, you've got a one dimensional center manifold, and basically you've got saddle node bifurcations. Okay. Yes, if some other derivatives vanish, and that's sort of typical in certain types of physical system where, for example, the origin might be constrained to be a fixed point, other stuff can happen, like transcriptional bifurcations or pitchfork bifurcations, but generically, you've got seven load bifurcations. And when you go through the um, imaginary axis, you have Hopf bifurcations. And in terms of loss of stability, that's it in co-dimension one generic systems. Okay? Two bifurcations for the flow. Whatever dimension you're in. Okay, so of course you can add symmetry, you can do all sorts of things that make it more interesting to jazz up the bifurcation theory, theory that you do. But that's about it for the loss of stability of a fixed point, stationary point. You could have global bifurcations. So, homoclinic orbits, which we talked about before. Shilnikov has a very nice um, classification. Um, basically, there are three types for maps, three for stationary points of flows. Um, there is a complication here that in this is a posh way of saying infinite modulus of stability is a posh way to say that actually the fine detail associated with some of these bifurcations is not, can vary from um, system to system, but the, I mean, roughly speaking, what happens is very robust. And uh, Jim York, again, had a very nice thing about how horseshoes, these small horseshoes, um, and period doubling cascades are so, sort of somehow typical about how you get to chaos. And so as I say here, Yes, you can make life more complicated in the smooth case, and people make careers out of doing that, um, partly because symmetry is really important. Okay, so if you start having symmetries, and I mean that in a really, really naive way, even just x to minus x. Okay, think about a fluid flow in an infinite layer. Well, it's got rotational symmetry, it's got Reflection symmetry, it's got translation symmetry. So symmetry isn't something you, you, you can say just I'm not going to be bothered with, unless you're a pure mathematician. And then you can say it's non-generic, I'm not going to be bothered with it. Um, instead of horseshoes, you can have solenoids, stochasticity, circle maps where there's sort of um, some additional stuff that you can do. But the point I'm trying to make is you have to try. The contrast to piecewise smooth is stark. So Filipov um, made a classification of, doesn't really matter what these are, these are sort of differential equations in the plane where you have two um, vector fields separated by, let's say, the x-axis, and you're looking at dynamics defined up here by one vector field, dynamics here by another, we're in the plane, and we imagine that we have a singularity, a stationary point on the um, on the um, dividing surface. And he found that there were six types, which isn't too many, but three of them have infinite numbers of topological classes. This is just in the plane. We're not doing anything fancy here. If you look at a particular case, the boundary equilibrium bifurcations, there are 12 different co-dimension one types. So we've jumped from two to 12 in the plane, not in R3, in the plane. And it's really hard to keep track of. The Bristol group, John Hogan and co, um, wrote a very nice paper called The Case of the Missing Boundary Equilibrium Bifurcations, where they simply went through the planar case and showed that in many of the previous works that happened, um, only 10, depending on who it was, eight, between 8 and 10 of the boundary equilibrium bifurcations had been actually found because they hadn't had a systematic way of doing this. Okay, so the first thing from this is there can be lots and lots of complications involved with, um, with having piecewise smoothness that you don't have with... Um, 
smooth case. Moreover, even in the simple bifurcation structure, the ambient dimension matters. Your f dimension of your phase space starts to matter. It's not a, just the dimension of the um, center manifold, it's the dimension of the phase space. But the other thing, as I've been trying to say, is you can often have easier expansion conditions, no infinite contraction. Um, also, piecewise linear examples were pretty good at manipulating linear equations. Okay? So you can often go much, much further with the piecewise linear, for example, than you can with the smooth, simply by, by just keeping very careful track of what you're doing and, and just, you know, it's a composition of linear maps, which isn't it's basically multiplying matrices together. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I have until half ten, don't I, in principle. So what I'm going to do, one of the things that you're taught at university is that one hour is too long for anyone to stand and stare at a screen. Okay. So one and a half hours is utterly ridiculous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do another couple of slides maybe, and then we're going to have a five minute pause where you can sort of shake around, talk to your neighbor, um, get some water, anything you want, and then we're going to start again in five minutes' time. So we're going to have a five-minute break to just sort of relax a bit. Okay, so introduction to maps. We're not going very far, but I hope you're picking up bits of ways of thinking. I'm not trying to go fast, okay? The point about this is not to, to run as fast as you can and then fall over. It's just to try and sort of get a feel for what we're doing. So, this was a smooth system. You know what that is. And map. Okay, you've got xn plus 1 equals f of xn is your map. And one of the most important things is a fixed point. x equals f of x. So then xn plus 1, if I'm x equals f of x, then xn plus 1 equals f of xn, and f of xn equals x if you're at the fixed point. So xn plus 1 equals xn. You stay there. Next, stability. Smooth systems, you do it by looking at the Jacobian matrix. The eigenvalues of the Jacobian matrix inside or outside the unit circle. Okay, so stability would be having all the um, eigenvalues less modulus less than one. And periodic points. Okay, a point is periodic. So I'm going to use F to the P. I'm sure you've seen this millions of times, but I'm going to say it anyway. F to the P is the piece iterate of the map. It's F of F P minus one or f after f after f after f p times, not the power of f, f of x, which I'll denote f of x to the p. So a periodic orbit is just a finite set, x, f of x up to f of p minus 1 of x, such that f of p of x equals x. So you just cycle through these as you go through. And it's sometimes worth emphasizing that usually I'm going to think about these as being a a distinct set of points, which means that P is the smallest period um, of the orbit. This is often left unstated, um, and when it's not the case, I'll usually try to, to bring it out. And if X has period P, then it also has period MP for only M greater than 1, because you just cycle through the period. And again, stability, this is, this is really important. So this is the chain rule. An application of the chain rule basically says that the derivative of the piece iterate is the derivative of the function multiplied along the periodic orbit. Okay, that's Suppose I'm interested in F2 of x, and I, I want the derivative of F2 of x. Well, d by dx of that is d by dx of f, that's just the definition, which is the derivative of the first evaluated at the second point times the derivative of the thing inside the bracket. And by induction, the derivative for f to the n is just multiplying the n derivatives along the line. Okay, and that's a really important little result. 
And we've already talked about the bifurcations. Right, I'm just trying to get to where I want to stop. Right, right so we've said this as well, so let's get, get this out of the way and then we can have a break. Center manifold theorem for smooth systems, typical bifurcations with independent phase space dimension, eigenvalues for passing through plus one gives standard saddle node. The new cases we get in higher dimensions, period doubling for an eigenvalue of minus one, and uh, hop bifurcation for um, non trivial e to the plus or minus 2 pi i theta. Okay, so eigenvalue of minus 1 gives you period 2, and if you have this, then you get, a, it's actually quite complicated for maps, um, but roughly speaking, you get invariant curves. If theta is rational, then you can have periodic orbits, and it's all a bit more complicated. But basically, that's the smooth case, and that's a very good place to have a five-minute rest. So we're going to now have a five-minute rest. So we're going to start again at 5.2 for 35 more minutes. Okay. So you can go and get coffee, you can get water, you can... Sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah, but you can, you can, you can leave the room. <laughs> or you can talk. <laughs> But anyway, first question is, are you bored stiff? Okay, am I going too slowly, or are you happy with this? Anyone want me to go much faster? Okay. Right. So we now come to what is one of my favorite results, actually. It's really trivial, but it's one of those things which gets you out of problems a lot of time. So this is one dimensional. So suppose we have a continuous map of the reals. It could be from an interval to an interval or whatever. And suppose it's increasing. Then every bounded orbit is either a fixed point or tends to a fixed point. So if I've got an increasing continuous map, the only interesting thing that can happen is things tend to fixed points. They could go off to infinity. But I'm not interested in that. If they stay bounded, they go to fixed points. If it's a decreasing map, then every bounded orbit is either a fixed point or a point of period two, or tends to a fixed point or a point of period two. This explains why Victor has to look at the discontinuities the whole time. So when you've got a piecewise smooth map, anything that avoids the discontinuity, if you look at the higher iterate of it, is monotonic. So the only thing that can happen is this. So if you want complications, you've got to involve the discontinuity itself. But this is useful too for the unimodal map. It's, and it's, if you can get things mapping to a place where the only thing that's happening is monotonic, then you apply this theorem and basically you're saying, I understand what's going on. Okay, up to the question about whether it's period one or period two there. So it's really trivial, but I think it's a much, much underrated theorem. Okay, it's, it's almost a lemon. I mean, it's, I'm going to prove it to you. Okay, so um, it really, it's not a hard result, but it's one of those ones that, I don't know, there, there are certain things. So when I'm teaching um, undergraduates in the first year, there's a technique in for first year, well, for actually probably for 16 year olds, called completing the squ on, um, unim on quadratic um, expressions. Completing the square can be really useful. It tells you immediately what the maximum or minimum is. It's the bit that's the constant bit. You know, it's, it's just one of those things, if you were trying to prove the quadratic formula, you do it by completing the square, and you've got something squared equals something. You know what to do with that. And then you take the square roots of both sides and get on with it. Okay? Completing the square is one of those overlooked, underrated, simple things to do when you're 16, 17. This, I think, in dynamics is one of the most underrated little results. It's not deep. It's not hard. But it explains why over and over and again, you have to go, you're thinking about the critical points, you're thinking about the turning points, you're thinking about the points of discontinuity. Okay? 
So just because this is simple, don't ignore it, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So as I've said, it is simple, and it's actually a really, really nice um, application of... So how many people have done a, I guess, first-year sequences and series course in mathematics? So some, but not all. So there's a thing about sequences... Suppose I have a sequence, x0, x1, x2, and so on. Okay, real numbers. And that's just a sequence. You could think about it as the orbit of a point, if you want, or it's just a sequence of numbers. But if um, the sequence is increasing and bounded above, okay, so that means increasing means that x0 is less than or equal to x1 is less than or equal to x2. Bounded above means there's some number m which you can't get, get beyond, then the sequence tends to a limit. So, I hope most of you have seen something like that before. Basically, it says if I've got an infinite sequence and it's going up and up and up and up, but it can't go beyond here, well, it's got to stop. It's got to be. It, it can't keep adding on and on. It's got to stop, but it can't go back because it's increasing. So it's got to get closer and closer and closer to something which is clearly less than the bound I've got, or less than or equal to the bound I've got. Okay, that's the technical bit for the proof. So, proof starts with a simple, I've, I've got, I like these big words, trichotomy and dichotomy are going to come in um, for the next few slides. So, a simple trichotomy. Trichotomy means one of three things happens. And here's the deep bit of mathematical thinking. If I've got an increasing function, so that's the, let's do the increasing bit here. So that tells me that if x is less than y, then f of x is less than or equal to f of y. Okay, deep mathematical point number one. Either f of x equals x, or f of x is bigger than x, or f of x is less than x. Okay, that's just life, you know. That's what less than or equal means. I'm sorry, it means <laughs> it's what those inequalities mean. They're exclusive, and so let's look at the first one. Suppose f of x equals x. Okay. Well, then that's what I call the fixed point. So the first case, we've got a bounded orbit, and it is a fixed point, which is what the theorem says. Every bound is either a fixed point or tends to a fixed point. So let's look at the second case. So case two. Which is f of x is greater than x. Which I'm going to completely confuse everyone by saying that's the same as x is less than f of x. Right. So now think this y is f of x. So just think about that as a y for a minute. Then the fact that f is increasing, I've got x is less than y, implies that f of x is less than or equal to f of y. So this implies that f of x is less than or equal to f of y. Well, y was f of x. That's the second iteration. So if x is less than f of x, f of x is less than f2 of x, or less than or equal to. But then that implies, using the same thing, knowing that equals is maintained, that f2 of x, taking x being f of x this time in that equation, and y being f2 of x, I just 
keep going now, induction. So F to the N of X is an increasing sequence. Okay, so in this case, I have an increasing sequence, and I'm interested, so either things go off to infinity or they're bounded. If they're bounded, I have an increasing sequence bounded above, so it tends to a limit. So if bounded, star, using this little result over there. But as f is continuous, If I apply f to this equation, the image under f, or under any continuous function, must converge to the image of this. But these two are exactly the same sequences, just change the labeling. So that implies x star equals f of x star is a fixed point. Okay. And if I'd taken the third choice, f of x is less than x star, then I would have found that fn of x is a decreasing function. Decreasing function bounded below tends to a limit by replacing x by minus x in this lemma. So if I have an increasing function bounded above, it tends to limit. But now just make x go to minus x, a decreasing function bounded below tends to limit. So it's bounded, tends to limit. f is continuous. f of x star, f of n plus 1 tends to f of x star, and you've got exactly the same arc. So in the increasing case, the only thing that you can have that's bounded is that things tend to fix points. I think that's a lovely, I mean, you know, if, if you ever think about doing some teaching of undergraduates and you're doing a bit of real analysis or you want to bring some of those things together, I think this is just such a lovely little example of how, how a little, what appears to be, you know, this looks like an abstract sort of thing that you learn in first year mathematics, but actually this is quite a, a useful Little result. So, what happens if um, f is decreasing? Well, if f is decreasing, the second iterate of f is increasing. Okay? So, if you think about it this way, if x is less than y implies that f of x is less than it, sorry, implies that you've changed the order. If you apply f again, it changes the order back. Okay? So, uh, if, if we have a decreasing function, then the second iterate is increasing. So all this applies to the second iterate. So for the second iterate, all that you can t tend to is fixed points. But a fixed point of the second iterate is either a fixed point of the map or a point of period two, which is why you get that choice. Okay. So actually, this is all the hard work. which means that the only thing that we have to worry about is places where things are not monotonic tonic or not continuous. Right, and we could just, just do a quick little diagram too that explains why this is true. So, so here's the diagonal. So suppose I have a monotonic increasing function, well, it might look like this. So in that case, if I start here, it's an increasing function, f of x is bigger than x, and I go 
to x, f of x. So here I'm going up, but it doesn't look as though I'm bounded. So the only way to bound things is to bring this down here, in which case I tend to the fixed point. And equally, if I drawn the picture down here, increasing function still, but it can go down. And actually, that's something that often, first time you see it, surprises you that because you think, oh, it's increasing, things must get bigger. Actually, increasing doesn't mean things that must get, get bigger, because if I'm increasing but below the diagonal, things get smaller. So you can go off in both directions. Okay. Right, now we're going to take an excursion from the... Oh, I'm not allowed to do this. How do I get to my computer? <laughs> you can go. I feel as I've transgressed something. Okay, so as I said, one of the things I want to do is contrast, if you like, there's a program that, we, that was undertaken between about 1980 and 2000, which sort of worked out what was going on in continuous maps of the interval, particularly the unimodal case, okay, so although continuous maps, quite a lot of it worked for. So suppose you've got a sort of dichotomy here. You've got the boring case, suppose things are not chaotic, then the rather remarkable thing, and again, remarkable and surprisingly easy to prove, is that if you've got no chaos, then the only orbits you can have are orbits of period 2 to the n. Okay, I'm not talking about attracting chaos here, I'm just saying if it's chaotic. So if you've got a smooth map, that is not chaotic, then the only periodic orbits you can have are period 2 to the n. Sorry, I'm working now in PowerPoint, and so I've used the LaTeX, as it were, to indicate 2 to the n. Or a Cantor set, in the limit, you can have a Cantor set with infinite sets of orbits, period 2 to the n. In other words, the existence of an orbit that is not a power of 2, periodic orbit, which is not a power of two, implies chaos in the smooth world. Okay. Not necessarily stable chaos. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about attractors here, but it implies the existence of chaotic set. And you have a sort of universality about period dumb and cascade. So once you realize that the only thing you've got are these period two to the ends, then the natural thing is, well, how do I get more and more of them? Well, you do them by period doubling and there's a very nice accumulation result for um, period doubling cascades. Right. Okay. And in the chaotic case, well, you've got the Sharkovsky ordering, which I'll come back to a bit later. Very, very nice result that's been done in a variety of ways. But really, the big advances in terms of really being able to do this well. So the first positive result, Jakobsen in 78, it wasn't really until the late 80s that people understood why this worked. But you have positive measure of parameters with chaotic attractors. We have an inductive decomposition of the normal... So non normal set is a particular way of describing the, the things that have recurrence with possibly infinite sets. And these are what... Um, Victor, did you call these bands? Or So, so when you had, um, in Victor's pictures, you had a single parameter value, you had a number of chaotic components to the map which were being cycled through. Um, and oops, finally, full families have been used in, in various ways, but full families do everything possible. So there is a sense in which you can say, right, suppose that I have a unimodal map, any unimodal map, it's got to be increasing, decreasing, Okay, but continuous, but no other constraint. What can it do? Now, there's a surprisingly easy answer to symbolically of what it could do. So then you have a problem of what does happen. 
And this is where the sort of thing that um, Victor was talking about yesterday becomes really interesting in the non-smooth case, or a piecewise smooth case. In the smooth case, the families of maps that do everything that you could imagine these things doing are really quite easy to re realize. In the non I keep saying non smooth, piecewise smooth case, then actually it's really hard to prove that everything possible happens. In fact, there are quite a lot of examples where it's clear that not everything possible happens. Okay, it's easy to prove that everything possible can be realized. Okay, so there exist maps that do every, everything, each thing that is possible, there exists a map that does it. Okay. However, if you take a general nice family, like the piece of smooth or something like that, then very often they don't do everything. And Victor showed a very nice example of that yesterday with the tent map, where he said it went from period one, and then suddenly you got all the period two to the ends. Bang, like that. Okay, So you missed all of the, the cases which had an attracting, or which only had a finite set of the period two to the ends. You jumped that. So in that transition that he showed, where you went from the stable thing to things branching through, okay, you made a jump. In term, you jumped over a number of possibilities. So if we go through these, we can ask, how are we doing in the non-smooth case? And let's do the easiest. So this is really, we're thinking about the unimodal case. So now suppose that we have maps with two monotonic branches. Okay, two monotonic branches that are continuous, you've got the unimodal case. Two monotonic discontinuous, you have something like this, you have something like that, and you have something like, hang on, that. So that's, hang on, I'll do it for you. So that's increasing, decreasing, increasing, increasing, decreasing, decreasing. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Um, and of course, by taking x to it, minus x, the increase. So, this is why I was doing this. So, um, increasing, decreasing, if I turn x to minus x, becomes decreasing, increasing. I hope that worked. Increasing on the left, on your left, decreasing on the right. So, increasing on the left, turn around, and the increasing is on the right. Okay, and that x, that's, that turning around is x to minus x. Okay, so if I, if I know this case, I also know that case and vice versa just by doing x to minus x. Okay. But this, if you like, is a challenge. Okay, in the piecewise smooth case, what's the equivalence? So what do we know? Sharkovsky ordering. There are some very nice papers with Mizierovich, Alceda, um, Libre, and people like that, that actually look at the Sharkovsky ordering for um, the piecewise monotonic maps. And there are things you can say, it's not trivial. Okay, I'll t if you don't know what the Sharkovsky order is, I'll come back to that in a second. Attractors, periodic orbits, what are the sets of periods? Again, that's non-trivial. I did something in the 90s, which I'm afraid I only published a couple of years ago, um, which looked at the, again, the simple sing, um, two monotonic branches case. And what I could show was that the set of periods was described by a chaotic set. So I could set up a thing that said, right, you can create a, two, a, you can create a double, then you can create this, you can create that, you can create that, Create that, and the description of the orbits that you could get equivalent to the two to the ends was itself chaotic. So there was chaos in the description of the non chaotic thing, which again is about the proliferation of cases, which is why, um, following the Barcelona meeting, that these, um, not these lectures notes, but the other lecture notes we were from, um, one of the things I wrote was something called Less is More. So we're trying to work out how much detail is actually useful to give. And if the answer to this 
don't, I mean, this is lovely, it's just two to the n. The answer is there is um, a chaotic system which describes the possible um, periods, then how useful is that? Um, so there isn't, there are equivalents of this, but nothing like a simple. Um, universal period Dublin cascades, the really nice thing for the differentiable families is that the accumulation rate, so you have period doubling, let's say, at mu n, we have period 2 to the n going to, or 2 to the minus n minus 1 going to period 2 to the n. Okay. Now, if you look at something like the accumulation rate of these, so n minus 1 minus mu n over mu n minus mu n plus 1, that tends to a limit, delta. And for the quadratic map, this is sometimes called the Feigenbaum or feigenbaum um constant. Delta is 4 point, I can't remember, 6, 6, 9, something. Okay. And that depends effectively, I mean, there are some other um, conditions, but effectively on the turning point being quadratic. Now, in fact, as you change the nature of the turning point, so mod x into 1 plus epsilon, okay, so then we have delta of 1 is 4.669. Okay, that reads squared. But there are well defined, but delta now becomes a function of epsilon. But it is still the case that you get this nice. Um, exponential convergence to these sorts of things. When you start adding in gaps, that very beautiful theory disappears completely. And instead of universality, you have exponential of exponential. It, it, things tend to con typically things tend to converge incredibly quickly, much much faster. And it's a bit like you know, get back again to the tent map. What you saw there. It was, there was no sequence. That was just explosion. You went from period one to pe all periods two to the n. No cascade at all. In the piecewise smooth case, even when there is um, nice cascade, when there are nice cascades, you tend to get this um, this exponential of exponential convergence, super exponential convergence. So, you, so things happen very, very quickly. It's very hard to see. Um, positive measure of parameters, chaotic attractors. Well, in a lot of the, and again, this is it's worth looking at this. So, if you go back to what I was saying about robust chaos, and I mean, Sumitra, did you say things about that in your course too, a, a bit? But, but what Sumitra and people showed then um, was that. This is much easier in a lot of examples. This was really hard for the unimodal case. It involved some very careful ex, um, estimates, as I was indicating before. In the piecewise smooth case, providing you've got sort of quite good um, control over the derivatives, this can be a non-question. Okay, it's not just positive measure, it's all parameters in some interval. So that's much nicer. Um, inductive decomposition of the non-wandering set, that has an entirely equivalent theory. And so we can pull that across in a very nice way. And that's one of the reasons I want to go into that a bit. Simple full families, as I indicated before, that's hard. So that's e so if you like, this one was easy for the piecewise, or for some classes of piecewise smooth, but very, very hard for the um, for the unimodal case. This was very, very easy for the unimodal case and incredibly hard, doesn't, doesn't even not true, um, for the piecewise smooth case. So, but what I like about this way of seeing things is it, it's suggesting different avenues of looking, different ways of looking at things. And then what one can do is take this sort of successful program as it was applied to the continuous maps and see how far we can take it in 
the non in the piecewise smooth case. And in, in some ways, a lot of what I'm trying to do in this series of lectures is saying, take that mindset of the types of things that we know about things in the smooth case and work out how that passes across to the piecewise smooth. Okay. So what are the techniques? Markov partitions, bifurcation theory, kneading theory. Kneading theory is very one-dimensional. There's a theory of pruning fronts in two dimensions, but it's never quite worked. Agodic theory, renormalization and induced maps, and different senses of expansion. So I'm not going to go into the details of bifurcation theory, I don't think, partly because I think Victor's done quite a lot of it. Um, I'm going to concentrate more on the Markov partitions and renormalization aspects. Um, I know you did some of the renormalization type ideas, but I want to go back to some of the simple ways of doing things. Um, again, this smooth, so th again, it's worth emphasizing the sort of philosophy of this. What smooth often gives you is a simpler way of seeing how you would do something in the non smooth case. Okay? But not always, as we've said. There are cases where things were really um, easy in the smooth case, where they're incredibly hard in the non-smooth case, or don't carry over at all. So we have to be a bit careful. Um, so the big question is, to what extent can we generalize this slide using these sorts of techniques um, to, to, to get a feel? So not the level of detail that Victor was going into, where he could actually tell you what was happening in different things. But if you like, it's a, it's a slightly different question where I'm asking, why is that what you see? Not what do you see, but why? Um, right. I think that's a really good place to stop. So what I want to do later this afternoon is start fleshing out how, really it's coming back to this, what I want to do is a little bit about two, I think, possibly three um, of these. We're going to do in detail the unimodal existence of an orbit not a power of two implies chaos. Because I think that's very nice, partly because it comes back to the use of induced maps. It's a very nice, simple, it's a bit like that um, monotonic map theorem. So it doesn't involve odd maths. Okay. And I want to talk a little bit about ideas of expansion and um, start to see how one could start proving things about um, piecewise smooth maps. So taking some of the thoughts from the smooth case across to the non-smooth case. And of course, one of the obvious places to start is going from smooth as in differentiable to non-smooth as in tent. So I'm going to do in detail a bit about the tent map, partly because it, and then I'm going to set you as, a, as, a, as an example to do more general types of um, tent map. But the, the nice thing about this is that it's something that is completely doable but it gives you an insight into that top right-hand question. So to what extent can we go through? And what we'll see when we do the tent map is we'll actually see this inductive decomposition of the non-wandering set coming in in a very natural way. And once we've seen that, and I'm a great fan in trying to do easy things first, okay? so. If you can get a picture in your mind about how things are working, what's possible in an easy case, then you have lots more chance of doing it for something hard. Okay. The other thing, just to finish, Markov partitions. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, Markov partitions. They're one of the few, they're special cases, but they're ones where you can actually prove stuff very easily. Okay, so the stuff you can prove and stuff you can prove. And so Markov partitions, in most examples, you can find, or families of examples, you can find special cases where you can say something explicit. And often that gives you a route 
That gives you a place where you can stand and say, right, I understand this bit. Now, if I move off from that, what, what can I do? Oh, he's gone red. Does that mean I have to stop? Okay, so uh, coffee time, I think. And I'll carry on this afternoon.